Hi, and welcome back to my podcast. My name is Kurt with x Guitar. For this podcast, I'm just going to talk about tracking your progress and things of the like. So, tracking your progress day to day and week to week, that's going to make a huge difference in the progress that you're looking to make. Of course, it's going to be important that you are at least knowing exactly what your goals, short term and long term goals, are. So you want to start thinking about your goals and we make checkpoints to see how we are aligning with reaching those goals. Um, some of the things that, that you can do, say for instance, trying to journal, and I don't necessarily mean you need to do these dear diary kinds of things, but maybe after each practice, you can write a few sentences or a paragraph or something, anything, that is just kind of capturing what you did to some extent and how you felt about it. Did it feel like you were comfortable with what you were performing? was your timing off was was it just not a great day as far as maybe you felt tired you woke up and you were just groggy and it wasn't a good day all those little things can add to how you are working in your guitar playing so another key point is we need to make the most effective practices for you by organizing and prioritizing the things that you practice and if you're not completely sure about how to do that i'm here to assist in prioritizing based on what your goals are the things that you need to learn so that you can make the most of your practice and get the quickest results for what you are trying to do with your guitar playing. I know that a lot of people that are taking the lessons are not looking to become famous musicians or professional musicians, but it would be nice to be able to reach your goals sooner than later so that you can reap the benefits of simply enjoying playing. Now, I'm not saying that you're not enjoying playing even when you're still learning to fret notes a certain way or strum a certain way or finger picking. You do find enjoyment out of it. I found enjoyment out of all of that. Even though there were times of frustration, I still found enjoyment out of it, and I wouldn't change the way that I did things. But I do know that had I had someone with me every step of the way to guide me to have more efficient practice, I would very likely be even better than what I am right now. So in addition to organizing and prioritizing your practice, you want to be consistent with your practice time. That is key. Think about it this way. You have a job, or you're in school, you have a schedule to follow. You don't just show up when you want to. Usually that's not the case. Most people have to follow a schedule, they have a boss, or they have rules for school. So in the same way, you should try to set up a schedule that you can expect every time you come to practice, this is the time that I practice. Some of you have really busy work schedules, some of you have a lot of other things going on, and the only way to really practice is to just carve out random times. That is sometimes the only way that you can do it. Hopefully that's just a temporary thing, and that's happened to me many times. Having consistent practice time is going to give you far better results because you fall into a routine. Think about, about when you get up in the morning. Most people get up in the morning and they might brush their teeth and get ready for the day and then they have breakfast and then they get to their job. Maybe you don't do it in that same order, but you have a routine to get, you, get yourself ready. It's the same thing that you should try to do with your practice time, whether it's early in the morning, middle of the day, or late at night. Whatever works for you. Maybe you have multiple times through the day. And you're saying to yourself, I can't follow a rigid schedule. I am not that type of person. Well, you can give yourself a little more freedom to make practice time without being rigid about your schedule. Maybe you want to have multiple practices throughout the day. That's also very helpful. And it actually might even be better because there are times that your attention span is just not going to work at a certain time of the day for more than 10 or 15 minutes. And then at a different point of the day, you might be able to get a half an hour or an hour of time in. I mean, whatever the case might be, only you really know what will work for you or how you work. I can't determine that for you, but that's another point that is pretty important, is figuring out how do you learn. That's one thing, because there's a few different ways that you can go about figuring out how you learn. So if you think about how you learn, there are eight different learning styles. I did a little bit of research on this myself and found that there's a linguistic learner, there's the naturalist, the musical or rhythmic learner, Another one called the kinesthetic learner, big words here, the visual or spatial learner, the logical or mathematical learner, that is definitely not me, the interpersonal learner, I can get on board with that one, and the intrapersonal learner. So if I just give you a very basic definition of each of those, we first have the linguistic learner, and that's a person who can learn better through reading, writing, listening, or speaking. And I'm just looking at one explanation of this where they say a linguistic learner can pick up on a new skill by maybe first reading about it and if there's per se an audio recording about it then that's another option and while listening to an audio version of it you can write down notes from the audio 
Another way is speaking about it, whether you're having a conversation with someone about it, or just kind of summarizing what you've gone over through reading and listening, and then talking about it out loud. It's interesting how speaking out loud can solidify something in your mind even more with some people. And then the other side of it is taking it internally and writing about it. I say internally because you're not thinking out loud. You're taking everything that you've done so far to download the information, and then you're trying to write about it in a way that will make sense to you. Now, the next thing on the list that I mentioned is the naturalist. Now, a naturalist can tend to be one who will learn by getting into the field. They love to experience what's going on around them and how it relates to what they're trying to learn. And when you are seeing what's going on around you and trying to learn from it that way, it's kind of what experimentation is all about. I know that I can relate with this in a lot of ways as well. For instance, if I am trying to learn a new scale or if I'm trying to learn a new concept, rather than just reading about it or listening to someone talk about it, I'm just going to want to dig right into it and get it in my hands. Meaning I'll grab my guitar and just start trying it. For some people, that's just how it works with them. But the nice thing is, whether you are one or the other of these eight different learning styles, you can always try a combination of all of these learning styles just to help embed this information that you're trying to learn even better. Now, the next one is called the musical or rhythmic learner. Now, you would think that with trying to learn how to play the guitar that this would probably be the most ideal for someone trying to become a guitar player or a musician. When, in fact, I find for myself, if I'm trying to focus on learning something, oftentimes music or other outside noises and things will distract me unless I'm trying to learn that specific song. If it's a song that I'm trying to learn or a section of a song that I'm trying to learn, then of course I'm going to listen to that song over and over again and annoy my wife and anyone with an earshot because I'll be listening to this one particular section over and over again for hours. But if I'm not trying to learn a particular song and I just happen to be playing music in the background while trying to absorb some new information, trying to learn some new skill that maybe I'm reading, it, reading about it, maybe I am experimenting with it. It depends on what I'm doing, but music itself could distract me. And for that reason, I would need to have silence or at least tune it out. Now, another thing with, with this particular type of learning, it's musical or rhythmic learning. So in some cases, some people will hum to themselves or whistling. They say toe tapping is another thing or moving, like tapping to a beat. Wiggling is another description. So there's also the kinesthetic learner. If you're familiar with the potential and kinetic energy that we learn in our science classes, that's where we get kinesthetic learning. And it is similar to rhythmic learning in a way. This one will involve interacting with objects in order to learn about them. And in the definition that I'm looking at, it says that a lot of the nature of these type of learners are scientific. Many of the kinesthetic learners work in hands-on types of jobs. Carpentry, surgery, jewelry making, physical therapy, dancing, acting, and others of that sort. The next learner type is a visual or spatial learner. And that one is the type of learner who uses visual aids to help in the process. Now, I've certainly used this as a way of teaching as well as a way to help me learn. Um, when I've used it in lessons, I will sometimes just create a large sheet that will have, say, for instance, a strumming pattern, and I might just simply write down in one color in big letters, and then an up in big letters just a little further away from it, maybe in a different color, and then down again in the same original color, and so on. So I might have like a down, up, down, up, down, and it's set up in such a way that it's easier for the student to visualize exactly what they need to be doing with their strumming hand while they are playing a certain chord. This has definitely been very useful in my lessons that I've given, both when I was giving guitar lessons and some years ago when I was working in the school system. So again, this is just another tool that you can use for yourself or if you're teaching anyone that can be useful to help remember how to do something, how to kick it off really well. This next one I feel like I relate the least in, and that's the logical or mathematical learner. I, I'm not going to say that I don't relate at all, because there are certain things that I definitely can relate with, like picking up on patterns, relationships and patterns to things, but numbers and equations have never been a strong point for me. When I teach the pentatonic scale, for instance, or the major scale, I am very much into learning patterns. I see the shapes, and I can associate the pattern and break up the full pentatonic or major scale a lot easier looking at it in that way. And then, over time, I can bridge the gaps so that they're not just separate patterns, they're just one whole piece. But it has been very helpful to me to be able to show others patterns in this way, 
whether you call it the C pattern, the A pattern, the G pattern, the E and the D patterns, or you're calling it pattern one, two, three, four, or five, that's really not as important as simply the basic concept of finding patterns and labeling them. A logical and mathematical learner wants to categorize things, compartmentalize. To a great degree, many of us, we are programmed to think this way to some level. And the next two, I would say that similarly to many of these on the list I can relate with, there's the interpersonal learner, interpersonal learner, meaning that you like to learn things working with others. You can relate with others through stories or working in a team or a group to pick up on a concept. You can compare your ideas with someone else. And when you're in the middle of doing something like that, it gives you the opportunity to see how someone else does it so that you can, can get a different perspective and try it out in a different way than what you originally came out with. In contrast to the interpersonal learner, there's the intrapersonal learner. This person or this type of learner prefers to learn on their own. I personally can say that there are times when learning interpersonally works really well for me. And sometimes I'll learn interpersonally and then I want to take it and then work intrapersonally on my own, analyze it, pick it apart, try it out more, see what made sense about it to me, chew on it a little while. And there are, there are certainly times when I'm going to learn a new concept without having anyone around and, and just take the intrapersonal learner style and at some later point, then I can compare it to what other people are doing with it. Sometimes it's nice to be able to just take something on my own and figure it out. And it, there's a certain satisfaction with it too when I take it on my own and learn how to do it without any other outside influence and then I can take what I've learned and bring it to a group or to at least one other person and compare and say hey this is what I've done what are you doing with the same thing and sometimes it's even more fulfilling that way all of that just to say that there are a lot of ways a lot of strategies that you can learn something the good thing is that when you look at all of these opportunities these different ways of approaching something it can make it a little bit more interesting for you so that you don't necessarily have a stagnant or boring practice you can attempt to take a look at it in a different way take a look at a concept or a practice item in a way that you don't usually look at things you might find when you analyze how you are learning something that you tend to take one certain way or maybe a couple of certain styles so if that's the case maybe if you find yourself in a in a point that you are just not warming up to something maybe you can try one of the other learning styles that have been mentioned and maybe that will help you to get past the hurdle that you're running into if you are running into a hurdle and and trying to motivate yourself to learn something new. Some other strategies are also to teach someone else. It's kind of like when you're taking something you learned to the group and comparing, but in this case, you might teach someone that you know isn't on your level, or at least isn't aware of a certain concept that you just learned. And by sitting down and teaching this other person how to do this new concept, it's going to further speed up you learning it better. You'll remember more as a result, and I can vouch for that because in the lessons that I've been giving over the years, most of those lessons have been beginner lessons. So you would think, well, how am I supposed to get better if I'm just going over the same beginner kinds of things? But it actually has improved me significantly. I mean, if we look back to lockdown when COVID first hit, that was a horrible time for everyone health-wise and so many other reasons, I mean, terrible situation. But one thing that I can say is that I was able to take advantage of the time of being stuck indoors. I was able to get the guitar in my hands a lot more often. My family and I were stuck indoors. The kids were taking classes from their laptop computers. I was working from my laptop all day long. I was working more since I was home, ironically, because I don't have a commute, we're all at home. So there was a whole different dynamic going on. But COVID happened and we're home and I'm finding more time available, maybe little micro practices in between things that I can pick up the guitar, I could sit it up right next to me get some work things done, take care of a meeting, take care of some other notes or whatever needs to be done. And then I can pick up my guitar as I'm thinking about something and just pick away at something, strum away at something for five, 10, 15, 20 minutes. I was able to get the guitar in my hand on a daily basis, which was huge because prior to that, it was only a few times a week, typically, that I was able to fit the time in. On top of that, because everyone else was stuck at home too, there were a lot of people looking for online lessons. So I ended up with a huge influx of online lessons, which was additional time of the guitar in my hands. So, I mean, it was longer days of work, but I was doing what I enjoyed. And pretty quickly I was beginning to see that the guitar was on my mind constantly. I was thinking about the lessons that were coming up, thinking about exercises that I could create, things that, that I could do to, to challenge myself and my students. So, so in, in essence, you could say uh, the world served up lemons. So what do you do then? Grab the tequila and make some shots. Actually, I'm just kidding. Tequila! Maybe. So what are some ways that you can help yourself get more practice in if you can't get the guitar in your hands all the time. There are ways that you can practice without the guitar. I mean, people joke around when they say that I'm going to be air guitaring, I'm a professional air guitarist. Well, ironically, air guitar can help. 
I mean, it makes a difference if you have some idea of what you're doing on the guitar. It doesn't have to be a lot, but some. And then you can imagine yourself playing a song. You may not know how to play the guitar to the extent of the song that you're listening to, but when you're air guitaring, you're estimating. It's a guesstimate of what you should be doing to make the guitar get the sounds that you're hearing. And it helps. You're developing more familiarity with the guitar. Little by little as you practice and you're actually able to get the guitar in your hands and trying different things, you can air guitar and you have a closer idea of where the song that you're listening to is happening on your guitar. Another way of practicing without your guitar is listening to songs that you're trying to learn. If you have a few songs in mind, maybe just one song, and you want to learn that song, listening to that song more often helps you to get more familiar with it so that when you are able to sit down and play your guitar, you can take what you've listened to and it's locked into your memory that much better. When you're listening to the song that you're trying to learn, you can listen for details that you ordinarily wouldn't hear. Pick apart the notes, the rhythm, the other details of the song. Try to separate different parts from each other. For instance, even though you're maybe trying to learn to play the guitar for a certain song, you could listen to that same song and try to isolate the percussion parts, the drumming, or any other instruments. Maybe there's a piano in there. Maybe there's a bass going on in there. Maybe there's a violin. Whatever other instruments are in there, there are times when you're listening to the song, you can hear those other parts very clearly, and then other times that they fade back. They may not have stopped playing, but they've faded into the background. So that's your opportunity to try to continue to hear what that instrument is doing. And when you consciously are tasking yourself to try to focus in on that one instrument that's playing through the song, this is a form of ear training. Attempting to initiate ear training on your own in this way is one way to trigger it in your mind. You start to listen for things that you ordinarily would not have listened for just by me telling you to do it. And then you saying, okay, I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna make this a habit of just focusing in on a song. You start to dig deeper. So these are just some ideas, some food for thought that you can keep in mind when you are trying to find time for practice. Don't tell yourself, I can't practice, I don't have the time. Try to take a different mentality about it and say, okay, well, I can't practice with my guitar. So I'm gonna just think about what I'm doing if I were playing with the guitar in my hands right now. You can do it pretty much anywhere at any time without disturbing anyone else. No one even has to know when you get home from work, let's say, and you're just too wiped out to be able to pick up your guitar and get any kind of playing in. Or you get home from school or a sporting event or anything else and you just don't have the energy to do it. Whatever is keeping you from it, just remember you always have some kind of an option that will help you to get some kind of practice in. It's not a complete loss. Well, that's going to be it for this podcast. If you haven't already, make sure to stay posted to my YouTube channel as well. You can like and subscribe videos. Of course, liking them is very helpful, but subscribing so you don't miss when a new video comes out is always helpful. And I'll talk to you soon.